Tonight we're in Perth where the new £26 million museum is due to open its doors to the public soon. Inside will be the Stone of Destiny, that ancient symbol of Scotland's monarchy. But that's the past. Tonight is all about the present and the future. Welcome to Debate Night. Debate Night is the only show in Scotland giving you the chance to ask the questions that matter to you, answering them on our panel this evening. From the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Alex Cole Hamilton, the MSP for Edinburgh Western and the party's leader since 2021. Born in Hertfordshire, he moved to Scotland as a child before graduating from Aberdeen University. From the SNP, Jim Fairley is MSP for Perthshire South and Kinrosshire. Jim was born in Perth and began his career in hill farming before launching Scotland's first farmer's market and going on to to build a successful catering business. He was elected to the Scottish Parliament two years ago. With us this evening, former First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond. Alex was the SNP leader for a total of 20 years and resigned after the independence referendum in 2014. A former Scottish politician of the year, he is now leader of the Alaba party launched two years ago. Claire Baker is the Scottish Labour MSP from Mid-Scotland and Fife. She's also the convener of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Prior to being elected, Claire worked for the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. And also with us tonight from the Scottish Conservatives, Ros McCall, MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. Ros was councillor for Strathairn on Perth and Kinross Council before being appointed to Holyrood last September, where she was the first MSP to swear allegiance to King Charles. Please welcome them all to debate night. And of course, welcome to our studio audience here in Perth. It's great to have you with us this evening. And you can join in the discussion from home, wherever you are. The hashtag is BBCDN on social media. Give us a follow at BBC Debate Night as well. And our podcast will be available for you to download right after the show. So let's get started. Our first question of the night comes from Frank Sloan. Frank, evening. Thank you. Will the Labour Party's decision not to grant new North Sea licences result in us sitting in the cold and dark when we've had a few days of the wrong kind of wind. Thank you, Frank. A uh, big announcement on this expected from Keir Starmer in Scotland next month. Jim Fairley. It's a strange one from Keir Starmer to come away with such a... Let's just cut off the taps. Uh, um, that, that's not what Keir Starmer has said at all. Oh. I know I'll get my chance, but it's not. I'm not, you know... You're jumping it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a strange one from Keir Starmer who's saying, let's just cut off the taps. And Claire can answer that when the time comes. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that we are moving away from oil and gas, but it's got to be that just transition. It has to be a staged process. And the one thing that I think that we absolutely have to guarantee here in Scotland is that we don't do what Margaret Thatcher did and leave huge communities decimated after that industrial base has moved on. We've got to make sure that the, um, the North Sea, the, the renewable capacity we've got up there, that the, the workers that are up there still have a long-term future. Not just the next five, 10 years, the next 25, 35, 45 years of making sure we make use of the massive renewable absolute gold mine that we have around Scotland's shores. So I think Keir Starmer will have a difficult job when he comes to Scotland to announce exactly what it is that oh, he's going to so do. Claire Baker, what is he going to say? Well, it's actually quite close to what Jim has suggested. And it, what we are saying is that we are facing a climate emergency. It is only a couple of years since COP was in Glasgow when it was recognised that globally we had to take serious action to uh, tackle the climate emergency. We are in danger of breaching the 1.5% uh, limit that we have placed on the world being sustainable into the future. And what Keir has is, well, the announcement we made in June, and he's coming up to Scotland to make the announcement, that's when the full package will be announced. What has been trailed isn't really a surprise. We have said we wouldn't give permission to Rosebank and to uh, Campbell in Scotland. We need to make a transition. We need to make a just transition. Already it's been announced we would increase um, jobs in the renewable sector, we'd add 50,000 employment opportunities onto the renewable sector. What we've seen is a lack of action from both the UK and the Scottish Government. In the UK government, if you look at what America's doing, what Europe's doing in terms of investing into green technology and green energy, um, 
the Tory government are far behind this. Uh, we're not seeing that kind of investment in Scotland. And in Scotland, there's been so many false dawns around a renewable sector. I mean, I represent Miss Scotland in Fife. I've got Bifab in my region. The turbines for Bifab we're meant to be doing are getting built in Indonesia and shipped back here. So that's what Frank's so worried about. Frank's missing. worried that if the wind doesn't blow, there's going to be no you know, power. What we will do is we're going to come up with an energy plan that will <clears> put billions into the investment that is needed that will encourage external investment. I'm on the Economy and Fair Work Committee. On that committee, we constantly hear that around the globe, we are reducing investment into oil and gas, and there is opportunities to invest in renewables. But the country needs to be open for business. And at the moment, both governments aren't providing that certainty for businesses to come to Scotland. This is not just uh, for governments to pay for the amount of money that is needed to make the transition away from fossil fuels into a modern renewable sector that we need to see if we're going to tackle the climate emergency. And there's jobs in this as well. Alex Salmond. Hey, well, I think Frank said, uh, would the lights go out? Well, the straight answer to that is no, because all they'll do is import uh, liquid petroleum gases, which are much more carbon intensive than producing methane uh, from the from the central or, or northern North Sea. No, oil and gas the, the, the question, of, clear, the question I asked, would the lights go out? And I'm pointing out what would happen would be import substitution, which makes it rather a, a, a daft policy. Uh, I don't think it's the right policy. I think the SNP and Green, when they, when they released in January, I think it was a, a statement saying there'd be a presumption against development. I think they're wrong as well. I think a better way to tackle this is to make it a condition of every consent in the North Sea that there's a carbon capture proposal, either to zero or even negative. Because, uh, you know, we've got an expectation of 80 billion in the next seven years coming in in oil and gas revenues, devoting even a small portion of that to make Flotta, St Fergus, Peterhead, Grangemouth carbon capture compliant, use the pipeline network to get the carbon dioxide back into the North Sea, it's important that this is tried at scale. It'll probably work because we've got a lot of geological experience. And if it does work, it's going to make up and potentially there's a capacity for 70 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's 200 years of the UK's current production of carbon dioxide. So instead of, you know, talking about pushing oil and gas jobs off a precipice, talking about a just transition, which you know can't be made in that time scale, then why don't we invest in the technology which might make an oil and gas future compliant with the future of the planet? Is he, is he right on that? I, I, today, Mary McCallan, Cabinet Secretary, said stopping all, simply stopping all future activity in the North Sea is wrong. Are you starting to soften your stance on the North Sea? Well, I've never softened my stance. We, we, I've, I've never actually believed that they should be stopping Completely. I've but always... You do have a position of presumption against new licences. Yep. That's the SNP and the Green position, yep. which is similar to what we have said over this weekend. Do you disagree with that, Jim? Yeah, I do. I think that we have to make sure that the, uh, that the resources that we've got, we have to use. As Alex says, we're going to be importing. If we, have to, uh, if we stop domestic lead production, then we're going to have to start importing it. Um, but the carbon catch that you talked about, the Acorn project was supposed to have been delivered to the northeast of Scotland. That was taken away by the, the Tory government. But in terms of the, the, the long term, we've got to have these, uh, <laughs> these abilities for the renewable energy. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And that's got to come in parallel yeah. with as we face but Jimmy, it. The, the hasn't been taken away. It's just still to it's be invested stopped. in. It's still there and the potential is still there. Just as Peter Ed Power Station, if Gordon Brown had invested in the carbon capture Miller project in 2007, we'd have the world's largest hydrogen burn station, a clean power station in Scotland. Now, these are huge opportunities. And for most of my political life, we've been missing the great industrial and economic opportunity for oil and gas. It'd be absolutely tragic if we miss the potential of carbon capture to reconcile our hydrocarbons with the planet and also, of course, the renewable bounty, which is there. For goodness sake, not, let's not make the same mistake and the generation on will be looking back and saying, if only we did this for this time, this time, let's just do it. Let's see what the audience think on this. Lady on the front row down here. Yes, on you go. Westminster has in the last couple of years issued record numbers of licensing for drilling in the North Sea. And Keir Stammer, how, it's Scotland's oil. How dare he decide without even consulting us that he will just help himself or just cancel it? It's not his, it belongs to the nation of Scotland. What do you, think, we have what to... do you, think, what do you think should happen moving forward? 
There needs to be a transition and it needs to be used. But at the moment, all that oil and gas gets controlled from Westminster and they pocket and trouser the profit. And meanwhile, I'm struggling to heat my home when Scotland's exporting heat left, right and centre through renewables. And Jim, the SNP, gave away the renewables for one tenth of the value yeah. offshore of, of, for the wind farms. At one tenth, you sold it off for one tenth of the value. You're not squeaky clean on this. You've not done well <laughs> okay, enough on this. Okay, hang on a second, Jim. Gross McCall, come in on this. Well, yeah, and I think there's some very valid points that are being made, but we are never going to get to where we need to go if we do not bring business along with us. They make the biggest investment in trying to move forward on a green agenda. They are the, uh, the, the companies in, in the North East, but equally all, all over Scotland that are producing oil. We need to be able to support them so that they can reinvest and they can look forward into renewals and make sure that our renewables are moving forward. So to cut that off and to, to cause that problem, we're just going to really cut our nose off to spite our face. It's really important that we work across with each other both governments and with business to make sure that we actually reach the targets that we have to meet. Alex Cole Hamilton. The lady in the front row there talked about the sell-off of Scotland's prime seabed for renewable potential, and she's absolutely right. This was called the Scotland Auction, and for some reason, Crown Estate Scotland, which is the government-owned uh, operator of the seabed, um, sold that at an auction price which had a cap of £100,000 per square kilometre. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but what auction starts with a cap saying, no, don't bid any higher than this, guys, whereas there was a similar offer off the coast of Lancashire uh, which actually um, was netted more than four times per square kilometre what's been sold. In fact, we have seen modelling which says, as you say, it could have been sold for ten times that. The second part of this, there was no phasing in this at all. All of it went in the same auction. That means all of your... Uh, successful bidders, some of whom are oil companies who probably don't actually have much intention of developing that for um, renewable technology anytime soon. They just want the credentials of having um, been moving in that direction. Um, that with that, you've got the uh, the reality that you will have no yards in Scotland with the capacity to take on the demand of building all these jackets and these turbines that you're going to see. You're going to see all that work offshored, all these the jobs that could have been brought to Scotland taken away to other yards in foreign lands, and we're not going to get the benefit of that, that renewables revolution. So it's a replay of what's happened with the oil industry mm. with what Westminster's just done. Yeah. It's but, exactly the but same. But it doesn't have but, to be like that. In today, is... Denmark announced that they were taking a 20% share in every one of their offshore wind fields. Exactly what the Scottish so, Government should be now be doing so as we can get the industrial So the Scottish Liberal Democrats have actually passed policy on this as well and it says that it shouldn't just be uh, money that doesn't come back into communities. If you get wind farms, if that's in, in, within your coastline or in, on your land, then your community should get a payoff as a result of that. That's just common sense. It should be part of the planning consent process for renewables. But we absolutely need to do this because let's not forget the urgency here. Claire talked about COP26 which happened in Glasgow two years ago and the, the moniker for that the, the tagline for that was keeping 1.5 alive let's just remind ourselves that 1.5 degrees Celsius is the increase in global temperature that we want to see within the next 50 years now yes we're going through the climate event that's called El Nino but we are seeing 1.5 being recorded year after year at the moment so this is on our doorstep it's happening now there's an urgency here that we can't ignore so yes I, I, I mean we also have what's called a climate checkpoint, so that any new drilling has to um, um, meet the tests of that climate checkpoint, which is set by the, the Climate Change Committee. Um, I'm not sure that any new fields are going to do that. So I agree with the presumption against new drilling, but it doesn't mean it will turn the taps off overnight because we've still got a lot of oil and gas production in the North Sea. Meanwhile, Frank's still worried about his lights going out. Claire Baker, are you, are you worried that this could cost you votes in the northeast of Scotland? There's so many jobs dependent on the sector as it is at the moment? Mm -hmm. uh, no, because part of the commitment is 50,000 new jobs in the renewable sector and the people who work in oil and gas, who are very highly skilled, who are well paid, we are committed to seeing that they are able to transfer over to other industries and industries that we need to see for our future. And also in terms of 
the current investment in oil and gas, uh, it's not a case of turning the taps off. Uh, the current fuels are there to be exploited and that will be embedded into the energy plans that we come forward with. The full plan will be published in June. But it's not about... Um, an any, you know, we, I mean, I represent Mid Scotland and Fife. So I grew up in the mining communities. When the mines closed, people lost their jobs. It took the heart of those communities. Those communities are still suffering from that industrial decline. That is not what we want to see in oil and gas because actually we've got a huge opportunity to opportunity to grasp a renewable future. Scotland does have fantastic assets. We should be at the forefront um, okay. of this movement. Can I say, all, all right. so there should be Just very briefly, be very briefly, Alex. The other, the other problem here is the abject failure of the Scottish Government to drive down demand in fossil fuels. We had an opportunity to begin a massive programme of public works to insulate every home in Scotland to make it a warm one, but we've not done that. We have, I mean, one of the biggest <coughs> sources of emissions is poorly insulated homes. All right, so Jim, Jim yeah, fairly on that, you could have done more to drive down demand. No, the, the, the Scottish Government have put millions of pounds into giving people the opportunity the to, to, to insulate their homes. It's they're not also putting in, they're also putting in, They're also putting in money to allow you to put in the, the systems that allow you to use electricity in a better way. So, uh, <laughs> ground source pumps, heat source pumps, all those Where kind of things. Where is this happening? It's happening all over the country. There's, there's people in my constituents are getting it done right now. So that's happening. The other thing you talked you about, the, you talked about Scotland. <laughs> Hamza Youssef, as the new leader, has already said that he will be looking to take a share in a national grid. Uh, the, the next round of the, the wind farms that are coming on. So the Scottish government are always looking at how we can maximise the opportunities and the, the, the resources that we have here, while at the same time trying to find the right way to make sure that people's houses are insulated, that we're using less oil and gas okay. ourselves, and making sure that we cut down our electricity consumption. All right, there's a lot we want to try and get through this evening. Your views and all you're hearing on the programme, the hashtag is BBCDN on social media. Tonight we are in Perth. Next week we're going to be in Edinburgh for our final show before the <coughs> summer break. So if you'd like to come along, as people have tonight, be part of the audience for that show, just go to the address on your screen right now, bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night and click on the form. Let's go to the second question of the night, which comes from Jim Parker. Jim. Has independence become a real distraction to focusing on the day-to-day -day issues at hand in Scotland. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Alex Salmond, as the man who delivered the last referendum for us on independence, has it now become a real distraction to focusing on day-to-day -day issues? Well, it shouldn't be, because uh, independence should be related. I mean, we've just been talking about Scotland's energy potential. We've been talking about people shivering their homes in the, one of the great energy capitals of the world. Now, if that doesn't uh, relate national independence, control of our own resources to the reality that people have been facing over this last winter. I don't know what does. Uh, and I don't know uh, anybody in Scotland who wouldn't exchange our position for uh, a country across the North Sea called Norway, where they've used the resources for the benefit of the, their people. Let's ask Jim. It illustrates Jim. why independence should be related right, well, well, let's ask, to the Jim, issues Jim, that matter. you asked the question, why, why did you ask it that way? Well, I asked it because it seems to the every single year goes by, there's so much time and resource. Everybody embeds into um, independence and the whole debate about it. That time and resource is scarce and it could be utilised on the focus on the, the things at hand. Well, For example, the NHS, the police yeah. service, mm -hmm. the, the Royal Mail, everything, everything that's to do with Scotland, education system, everything in Scotland is in crisis at this point in time, I would say. And this is all this time and energy that's been wasted on, on this. Now, yes, it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut. There'll be some point in the future that possibly might happen, but my argument is the compounding effect over time right. has, had its, well, Jim, has, has had a negative effect okay, on Jim, what's I'll, happened I'll so far. Alex, speak to Jim. Right, Jim, you've got a good argument, because uh, uh, there's a lot of difficulties in the current Scottish Government policies across a, a range of issues. Uh, there's a number of very divisive issues which are not uniting Scotland, at a time when you should be uniting Scotland, particularly when you're under threat in many areas from Westminster government. But, you know, I always thought, eh, as First Minister, a key job was to demonstrate the competence and efficiency of the Scottish Parliament in government. Is that uh, not happening at the moment? Well, I mean, all I'd say is in the 2014 referendum, people said many things about independence. There was fears about this, that and the next thing. I don't think one person ever said, you can't run the shop in Holyrood because people thought the Holyrood Parliament was run better than the Westminster Parliament. And incidentally, Jim, the Westminster Parliament doesn't spend its time thinking about independence right now, but that doesn't make for good policy, because they're even more catastrophic 
than the Scottish Government at the present moment, with more problems, with more issues. So just not talking about independence doesn't produce good government. My view is that Hamza Yusuf should concentrate on sorting out the health service, the education system. He should dump some of the lack of common sense policies that he's embarked on and get on and demonstrate once again to people who can run the shop and let the campaign groups uh, campaign for Scottish independence and bring that matter to a conclusion so Alex, at that, the next that, general election. Alex, that begs the question, if not when, do you think you will see independence in your lifetime? It's something I, you've campaigned for all your life. I, I do. I, I, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, independence... Look, ten years ago, when we embarked on the first referendum, support for the SNP was at 50%, and support for independence was below 30%. Now it's the reverse. Support for independence is around about or over 50% in some polls, and support for the SNP is down at somewhere in the 30s. So I would like a situation where the support for independence was reflected in the political parties that support independence. And I would like the political parties that support independence to make it clear at the general election next year, and in the absence of a referendum at every subsequent election, that they're looking for a mandate to negotiate okay. independence from Westminster. All right, okay, you've got this independence convention next month, yeah. Jim Feely, but only for SNP members. Right, there's quite a few things to unpack here. Um, first of all, I completely disagree with Alex's point of view that uh, the SNP haven't been in good in government. We've had a solid, consistent 15 years of delivering for the, no for the people of Scotland. No dentists. We have, well, we have got times. a solid track record. And Wait, if it was so bad, if it was so bad, why do the people of Scotland second, can, why do the people of Scotland continue to vote for the SNP in record oh, numbers? We've just won the May election two years ago. We just won the May election two that's years ago answer. with sixty-four seats. It's one shot oh, of the I absolute majority, you. which is what Alec achieved just not that very long ago. In terms of independence, to me it's an imperative. It's an imperative for all the reasons that we spoke about before, for all the things that we want to sort so that we've absolutely got the control of things here. As far as the independence uh, or the convention being uh, for the SNP, it's an SNP conference. It's about the SNP's decision on how we're going to go forward. Alec supports an independence party. They can come up with their own policy. They can come up and they can We've deliver. They one, can tell you <laughs> what that is. But in terms of branding, when we go to the election next year, the SNP, if I chap anybody's door, in Persia, South and Russia, I say Jim Fairley from the SNP, they know that I stand for independence, 100%. There's no dubiety about it. So if they know that I stand for independence, by the time I've knocked the door, that brand is potent. That brand lets people know that that's exactly what this oh, party stand. is for. So the question that you then ask is, okay, what do we gain out of Alex's proposition of that the SNP, what, stands aside? Doesn't, yeah. doesn't take part in, in the election? No, it's no that's, that's, not, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. He's right. also talking about our polls being down at 30%. You know that. We've had a difficult couple of weeks. Make no mistake about it. A couple of weeks. Been a, a been few a months, I think, time. actually, hey, Jim, rather than weeks. Absolutely. <laughs> and I will take that one absolutely on the chin. But let me make one point. All this, all this talk about where the finances are going, bear in mind, that's SNP money. That's not taxpayers' money, which has been alluded to in the past. So the position that we're talking about just now is the SNP coming through a difficult period of time. We're still well in the 40s into the polls. Independence still sits at 53%. We are the branded party that is recognised across the country standing for independence. So why on earth would we want to step aside and allow well, somebody else to take that just, just, Give me a second, because I want to hear from the audience, because they will decide this at the end of the day. Lady in the back row at the, in the middle, yes. Thank you. Hi. I'd just like to follow on from what Alex is saying. You know, rather than sniping at the SNP, what plans do the ALBA party have to make a positive contribution to independ the independence right. movement? All right. Okay. Alec, I'll come to you in a second, mm -hmm. but just let me grab some more views. The blonde lady there, yes. I cannot believe that there are SNP politicians so de delusional as to think that people vote for them because of how they've governed well. You get our votes because you are the official party of independence. You have not delivered. You're going to get one heck of a shock at the next election because we are tired of it. Absolutely tired of you. Not delivering, not delivering, not delivering. People are suffering in Scotland. They are poor. They can't feed their families. They can't heat their houses. 
Hmm? And yet we are a well-off country. Okay. Hmm? And okay, you're then. sitting okay. comfortably in Holyrood and Westminster. Hang, hang on a second. Let him reply to that I'm point. Angry. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I can okay. tell that, Jim. <laughs> How you're, you're, you're clearly upset, and I absolutely. I think take a that. few of us are. Yeah. No, and I absolutely accept yeah. that. But when you say that we haven't delivered, the SNP. <laughs> went to Holyrood, we said we need the Section 30, we want to have our independence referendum. Oh, you so, don't ask for it. Unfortunately, the Labour Party signed us up to the 1998 Scotland Act, and in that, they said that the law took our sovereignty, our ability to make our constitutional future known and decided upon, and they gave it to Westminster. So the 1998 Scotland Act is the law. As much as I hate that, but her as point, much as I want her nothing point to do is with about that, governance to date, Jim, and the way no, the part. I, I, I took her point to being that what you were saying was we delivering need to deliver ferries, independence, and you're absolutely right. NHS. We need to deliver independence. That's why we're going to have this Stephen. conference next month. Did the Irish um, ask for it? Okay, Stephen. Okay, they, you're okay. Me. Ha hang on a second. Hang on a second. I want to hear from more people in the audience here. Gentlemen in the second row here. Yes, on you go. Going back to Jim's original uh, question, and that was, has this sort of focus on independence been such a distraction to industry, to business throughout Scotland? You know, it, I'm fearful that if, if, the, if the Yes campaign are given another opportunity to have a referendum and the Yes campaign on that occasion then win, and let's call it 55-45, would it be fair to say, let's have another nine or ten years of wrangling and then have another referendum and, and go for the best out of three? <laughs> OK, hang on, hang on. Well, gentlemen in the front row here, and then we'll bring it back to the panel. On you go. How come the support for independence hasn't risen under the SNP since Alex Salmond has arrived? Polls have continuously said that it's been about the same amount of levels since about recently. Hmm. What, what's the SNP actually been doing? Why are you not communicating a deal with Westminster like how Alex Salmond did? OK, OK, very briefly, Jim, so I want to get around the rest of the panel. Well, on independence this. is actually sitting at 53% right now. The, uh, independence continues to rise. In terms of, it's sitting at 53% right now. <laughs> so, Stephen. We, well, we, different, different polls tell different stories, <laughs> right, okay. as always. The, the poll that I've seen very recently is 53%. And as far as I'm concerned, we've got to have that continuous day-to-day -day conversation with the people of Scotland to say, why would you not want to be independent? Why do you not want your country to be in control of all your own affairs? Right, hold that Why thought. Alex Salmond, is, is that the right approach, Alex Salmond? Well, I, I, I think, to, to answer the lady's question, I mean, what the, the Arab say? Well, I, I think we have to recognise that now, because of what we've been talking about, the national movement is bigger than the, the Scottish National Party. I mean, the SNP is the biggest party by far within the independence movement, but it's not the only force in the independence movement. And what the proposition is, Jim, is not for SNP MPs to stand aside. Every SNP MP could continue and stand as an SNP Scotland United for independence candidate. There would be Alapa ones and Green ones, perhaps a few independents who support independence because it would give the correct impression that independence is a matter for a, a national coalition. It's and a if national they don't do purpose. that, Alex, it's if not they don't the do that, what happens? Well, you know, you can only, you can only, you know, you can only cast your bread upon the water. You can make the offer because that is the way forward. Uh, you have to be, have the, the, the understanding and the, the modesty to admit that you can't be the sole preserve of a national movement which is much bigger currently than the SNP. Okay, and it would uh, help people uh, if you say this is not a matter of party politics, it's a matter of Scotland's right to self-determination and its right, right. as a nation. Understand no, 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 hang on a second. Right. Understandably, this is focused is going on to be the SNP. But there are other people on the panel with a perspective <laughs> on this as well. Rose McCall. Jim, I'm going to answer your question, if I may, because I would agree with you 100%. The focus, I'm out knocking on doors. Um, I, I was elevated to an MSP um, and I'm very proud to be in that position. But to do that now, I'm out there knocking on doors regularly. I speak to a lot of people, regardless of party persuasion, a lot of SNP supporters, who are saying that the focus right now is on the wrong thing. We have problems getting a GP appointment. We have problems getting a dentist appointment. There are problems with yeah. our education system. There are violence in schools. We have ridiculously long waiting times. We have A&E problems. All of this is the focus. This is what the government should be focused on, not another independence referendum. And this is coming back to me time and time again, and it's used permanently as a grievance card. How can we find a way to stoke the grievance issue so that we can create a situation so that we can now bring back independence as a reason to come forward. Right now, 
Everybody is telling me that we should be focusing on the problems, the real prior problems in Scotland, the real priorities that we should be looking at are fixing our NHS, sorting our education. So, so why are 53 percent of people in polls well, choosing to support? As, as you said yourself, polls come and go. I am going by the information mm. that I am getting on the doors and I, I am out there talking to people every but week. Support for independence has been consistent. I would say that the polls come and go. We look at various different times. We've had polls recently that, that have had um, unions, uh, the unionist side up and, and showing strong. So I would say that polls come and go. What I'm hearing right now from the people on the doorsteps is that this is not the time. And I'm not just talking about people who are unionists who are supporting the, the, the Conservative well, Party. I'm talking to people who are saying that they're SNP supporters. Doesn't it look like Alistair Jack as Secretary of State for Scotland is actually picking fights with the Scottish Government. No, well, that's that's and actually, th question. those that's polls the wrong way may vary on the SNP, but they are pretty static when it comes to the question of independence. Lady in the Green here. My question, excuse me, I've got a sore throat, is for Ros. Sure. How are the polls looking for the Scottish Conservatives right now? <laughs> yeah, obviously. And I would say the polls come and go. And of course we've got work to do. Of course. You're no, going. okay. And, and that's, I see you're more that's effective with your voice Thank like you. that as well. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I hear that. Gentlemen up the back there. Yes, on you go. Yes. Hi there. Yes, if the unionist parties can join together to uh, keep the union, why can't the independence parties join yeah, yeah. together Absolutely. and support independence? Yeah. Alex Cole Hamilton. <laughs> well, just taking it back to the original question, I'm going to start that answer with a statistic. 172,000. That is the number of people right now in Scotland who are suffering the debilitating condition known as long COVID. I met with some of them last night. It is perhaps the biggest mass disabling event to hit Scotland since the end of the First World War. Why do I bring that up? Well, right now, if you've got long COVID in Scotland, you'd be better off moving to England in terms of the care pathway that is available to you there. What, what do I mean by that? Ministerial disinterest, ministerial disinterest has seen only £10 million and only £3 million of that actually allocated. It's all true, Jim, and you know it. What's that um, got to do with the independence question? But I'm question? just coming on to that. £10 million is half what they budgeted, which, which is what they've given to long COVID, is half what they budgeted for a second independence referendum. They even, Hamza Yusuf, when he came into office, created a ministry for independence to keep his troops happy, where all the time we are a nation that used to be shipbuilders, we used to have a proud industrial strategy. That all lies in tatters on the yeah. altar of ministerial disinterest. Why? Well, because this Mr. government Pratt is fixated the with the separation of this country. And now you talk about the polls. People People, of course, those numbers have remained pretty static. But if you ask somebody, how do you feel about independence? They may support it. How important is it to you right now? It is right down the bottom. People are far more interested in who's going to close the educational attainment gap after COVID in my kid's school. Who is going to make sure I get my hip operation in due time? Nobody trusts the SNP to do that. And we go back to this situation that Jim's telling people, well, everyone keeps voting for us. I agree with this lady. You're in for a shock. Jim Feely? I disagree, Alec, because I know that when I'm chapping the doors, I know when I'm speaking to people, yes, there's a lot of frustration at the moment. The point that you made about the, the long COVID uh, clinics, by the way, it's absolute nonsense. It's not. I, I'm the convener 15 of the, pounds ahead the COVID in Scotland, 104 pounds convener. ahead in England. I sit in the committee. We've had the conversations. We've just done the long COVID inquiry. The Scottish Government are now coming back with a response, and they're going to work on the, the issues no money. around that long COVID system. And when they do it, it's going to be based on the report that we've just done, but what, you're ask, what you've been asking for, and what the, the Tories have been asking for, is you've got to put a clinic in place. I've got them down in England. We've got a different pathway system. And you get what 15 actually, pounds ahead of Scotland. We're, we're, we're pounds getting off the of topic England. here. That gentleman's point there, if the unionist parties can work together, why can't the independence parties? There's absolutely no reason why the, 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 the yes parties cannot work together. Absolutely. Well, you're not doing it at the moment, are you? Then. Well, 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 do you want to shake hands together. on that now? Yeah, do you want to do it now? We, 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 we are hands. working together. <laughs> Alec will stand for Parliament if that's what he's going to do. The SNP, with the brand recognition that we have, the absolute no frills, no doubt about it, that the SNP is entirely about delivering independence and we have to navigate our system through Westminster because we were tied to the 1998 Scotland <coughs> Act, which gave our constitutional rights to Westminster. We've got to work away how we get through that. That's what we'll be discussing. OK, all right, I'm going to the gentleman in the jacket one. down here. Yes, on you go. I, uh, I, I know it's difficult to uh, judge priorities and to get that right, 
But um, we've got to, you know, things are, are they, is it urgent, is it important, is it both, is it neither, you know, that kind of thing. We've got to look at the bigger picture here. I've, I've spent a bit of time in some other countries, small countries, who are doing very nicely, thank you very much. Uh, places like Estonia, uh, places like Mauritius, who uh, are envied by their neighbouring Réunion because as a as the département of France, they can't do the things that they can do in Mauritius. And uh, it's just looking at that bigger picture. I have to kind of declare an interest here because in 2014, I lived in England, I didn't have a vote. If I'd had a vote in that referendum, at that time, I would have voted for the union. Uh, unfortunately, there was another irresponsible referendum after that in 2016. And we're now in a situation where uh, the, whole, the whole arrangement has changed. And you go back and look at it a bit more closely, and you look at the cultural and educational differences between Scotland and the rest of the UK. How would you vote now? Absolutely for independence. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And we need to get that first, and then move on to addressing All right. the other. It's a, it's a question of priority. Claire Baker, speak to that man. What do you think? Well, I'll come back to the first question, if that's OK. I'll start with that. Um, and I do agree that it's a distraction. If we go back to the last Scottish Parliament election, it was two years ago, the focus in that election from all the parties was about recovery from the pandemic. It had a huge impact on our economy, on our education system, on our society. And the time Nicola Sturgeon, who was the then First Minister, she gave commitments that that would be her priority. And for the government to come in and now start focusing on independence does draw away, I think, importance from the key issues that are on the table. Yeah. And if you look at what's happened with the polling, whether it's 53 or it's 49 or whatever, it just sits around about 50-50. So you've got a country on that issue that is still divided. Having a referendum is not going to resolve that. And even the people who do support a referendum, the majority of them feel this isn't the time to have a referendum. The, the key issues in the country are about tackling um, our economy, about recovery from the pandemic, about the climate issues that we have to address. And the real, the first electional challenge that comes is going to be next year. It's going to be a general election. And if people in Scotland want change, they should be voting for a Labour government and get rid of this Tory government that is causing problems in Scotland and across the UK. Indeed, we didn't even bring Brexit into that discussion, which could have been a whole other avenue yeah, as well. The hashtag is BBCDN and social media for you to get involved in the conversation tonight. Let's go to our third question of the evening, which comes from Olive Noel Perrins. Olive, evening. Hi. So Scotland's lauded for A&E performance, and it is good. But despite lowering birth rates, we've got record infant mortality. We've got the highest in-hospital avoidable deaths. We've got the lowest life expectancy across the four nations. What are your plans to keep more Scots alive longer? Yeah, life expectancy actually falling in Scotland. Alex Cole Hamilton. Well, there's a lot in that question. Firstly, there's the state of our NHS, and uh, you know, I absolutely take my hat off to all our amazing key workers. And the fault of delays and cancelled operations and cancelled diagnostics, which is in large part responsible for avoidable deaths, is not theirs. It's actually due to a problem in social care outside of hospitals. Why do I say that? Because every night, uh, thousands of patients are languishing in hospital well enough to go home but too frail to do so without a social care package to receive them. As a result, those beds are taken up, it leads to cancelled operations, delays in the A&E, it's an interruption of flow and throughout the whole of our NHS. But over and above that, we are a sick nation. We are a sick nation. And yesterday, we heard the Scottish Government deliver something of a nothing burger, pardon the pun, um, of an announcement about health promotion um, activities because it's still trying to take um, soundings. It's not entirely sure where to land on these things. I sat on the Health Committee in the last Parliament and we recognised the very particular problem that Scotland has with obesity, that we are a sick nation and we are growing sick sicker and the pandemic didn't help that it's about access to activity but it's more than that it's about making sure that we don't have food deserts where it is you know impossible to walk to somewhere which will sell you fruit and fresh produce um, but there's a range of other things as well so um, half of this is in the health service and in the social care sector but my goodness we've got to protect people, get them to be well. In ancient China you paid your doctor every day that you were well and you stopped paying him when you were sick and that says a lot about the model of healthcare they had. They valued well-being. They saw that health was more than just the absence of symptoms. And I think we need to recalibrate and focus that in Scotland. Uh, Jim Fairley, is some of used to being able to roll back on some of these commitments around tackling the obesity crisis? No, I don't think he is. Um, 
Uh, had no, I mean, yesterday we had three consultations. There's no progress being made on any of those. <laughs> There's a statement in Parliament. Alex is right. The government have just not taken any serious action. What's on, going on? on well, this? well, no, they, they, they have taken. I, I remember when I first got involved in the, the, the food and drink sector over 20 plus years ago. And all the talk at that time was about the explosion in childhood obesity and all the rest of it. Um, the, the work that was done to try and get better nutritional standards into schools, better nutritional standards into hospitals, we actually hosted a, a summit here in Perth. By a, a, yeah, the a problem is it's not making... Obesity, obesity Action yesterday said that the government will miss the target on childhood obesity. It's something that I personally feel quite strongly about. Yeah. They will miss the target on childhood obesity. Yeah. Um, do you know, so I, I do recognise the things that have been done and the attempts that have been made, but they're not making the progress that we need <coughs> to see. So, we, you know, I think you accept we do need to see more in this area. 100%. There is no way that I'm ever going to sit here and say, no, we're actually doing fine. No, we've got a hell of a lot more work to do. But that been doesn't... For 16 years. Hold on a wee years. second, Alec. Mm. That 16 does not, years, that, Jim. Just hold on. 16 years. That does not negate from the work that has been done over the last 20 plus years. Robin Gourlay introduced the, the walking the talk and that was specifically based on the ideas that we need to get children and young people eating better. We tried to bring in the things where you, you, you get rid of bog offs. People choose the food that they eat. They choose to... to, to I tell you what the biggest problem from my point of view... Well, the biggest obesity, problem is our well, life expectancy is falling. It shouldn't yeah, be in 2023, the, the, should the it? Big, the biggest problem from obesity's point of view, from my point of view, and I've talked about this for years, is big food companies controlling our food system. I've been a huge advocate of buy local, eat local for a very long time so that we actually eat the food that's closest to our home. The, the big companies that are bringing in from the, the... I can't name them. The salts, the fats, the sugars, the stuff that's in food is incredibly addictive and it's also hugely fattening. Now, if we talk about the health service, I'm sorry, the health service is too big to talk about in one answer because there's far too many different facets to it. But in terms of the point that Alex is bringing up about obesity, the government are working hard on it. Yes, there's a hell of a lot more 16 work to do. 16 years, Jim. There's a hell of a lot more work to do in it. Well, you've got to allow people to make the choices for the foods okay. that they're going to Ross eat. McCall, the problem is we're in a cost of living crisis where people are making the cheapest possible choices a lot of the time mm. to feed their families. But we also don't educate properly. I mean, we, oh, as no, a councillor, no, as we, a councillor, we, we had we great difficulty finding home economics teachers. Yeah, we, we were having absolute problems. So we've got. Um, we've got young people and children coming through school and they're not learning the same way on how to actually buy their food properly and cook it at home properly. So we've got to take that into consideration. So it's our fault. It's not the fault of the multinationals or the big food corporations. I'm saying there's a definite part that has to be played because we need to, we need to have our, our, our young people and children learning the right way about food. It's not just about learning about nutrition. It's about learning how to cook, how to take, buy properly, cook properly and make something last. It's, it's, there's an awful lot that comes into play with this. And we do need to look at our health service as well. We can't look at these two things separately and just look at obesity and those issues there. And as somebody who struggled with their weight all her life, I know this firsthand. It's something that's very difficult, something you've got to, got to work at, you've got to understand, you've got to educate yourself. And we need to be giving our young people and children the best start they possibly can, yeah. and we're missing it because we just can't okay. get the teachers. I'm going to come to you in just a second. Uh, young man up there. Be mean, but Roz is completely wrong. I say this as someone with a background in nutrition. Education is one of the least effective interventions. It has to be about the food environment and about um, regulation of food and what actually goes into making that. Especially when the cheapest foods are highly processed ones, we need to be taking yeah. sugar and fat out. So that actually means serious government intervention. Okay. The, <coughs> sorry. Sorry. I just want to take the lady in the back row as well. Uh, yes. Hi, oh, yes. Lori's Roz and. Um, the lady from the Labour Party, sorry, Claire. I've forgotten you, Claire, and Alex at the end there. I'm sorry, but you three really need to have a hard look at yourselves. You're busy blaming the Scottish Government. I'm sorry, the Scottish but Government has government. a severe... Hang on a second. Let me make a point. Let, no, let me make a point, point please. Okay. I've been courteous to listen to all of your points. Please let me do the Please have the courtesy to do the same for me. Westminster cuts the budget to Scotland from the revenue we send down. It gets continually cut. You're busy slagging off the NHS. They're not doing their job properly. They're not getting the funding. S Scottish government needs to I'm look at this. That. I'll give you one simple thing. People don't understand shop local because the stuff is too, bit, too expensive. Mm -hmm. We're getting goods from south of England, 
wherever, coming up to supermarkets, because that's what the supermarkets do. They control what's on our shelves. I've seen on social media recently strawberries with the Union Jack plastered all over it, and they were from a farm in Angus. I'd much rather see source of where the local food is from and who grew it, where it's from, shop local, and the price is coming down. Oh, okay. We're using transport far too much right. for food. I hear you loud and clear. Alex Cole Hamilton. Being in government is about choices. This isn't about cuts from Westminster. This is about direct choices that the SNP government have made over 16 years. For example, they want to spend a billion pounds of your money on a ministerial takeover of social care because they don't trust local authorities to deliver social care anymore. That's just going to pay for the vast and unnecessary bureaucracy. Imagine what a billion pounds could do for the NHS, for those and those cancelled operations, or for improving health and health promotion. This isn't because somebody else's fault. This is absolutely because health is 100% devolved to the Scottish All Parliament right. at the feet of the SNP. Oh, OK, OK. Alex Salmond, what would um, you do to give Scots well, longer, healthier lives? Well, I, I'm with the lady at the back. I mean, I, I go up the supermarket shelves desperate looking for salt tiles so that I can, uh, I can buy the produce. The, the life expectancy is not just a matter of between nations. It's between areas within nations. Absolutely. If you have, go to Castle Mill, you'll find the life expectancy is 10 years less than it is in Bear's Den, you know, a mile or two away. And that should tell you that it's not the only thing, but the fundamental thing in terms of life expectancy is dictated very early, and it's about poverty. It's about lack of life chances. Uh, now, the Scottish Government have done some good things in terms of child poverty. The child payment is an extremely good thing. I wish we would take the opportunity of, of universal school meals more than just giving kids a, a good, healthy meal a day. That's very, very important. Or two, hopefully, if it's breakfast and lunches. But see it as part of the, the educational opportunity that the gentleman at the back says is difficult to do. But surely it's possible to have a, a module around the school meal system, a universal provision which accents local produce and explains to to children the, uh, the benefits of, of having healthy nutritional food. And if I can just give one example of, of where in Europe that has worked, uh, Finland uh, used to have the highest heart attacks ratio in the continent of Europe. And they introduced a very heavy school meal policy which had fresh fruit, raspberries in particular. And that was given credit for some of the dramatic reduction in heart attacks. So I think school meals is a practical policy which the Scottish Government is committed to, which should be accelerated and should be used as the basis of changing the, the, the colour of people's thought as regards nutritional value. Okay, a quick couple of voices from the floor first. L lady there. Alex, you're talking about school meals and local produce. You know, in this area, school meals are now shipped in, frozen from goodness knows where. They're certainly not being made with local well, produce. They're not even being made that's locally. The, that's the point I was trying to make. You're, you're making it better for me. That's, that's what should happen with school meals. You know, we need to get back to the basics yeah. of that. And Roz, you're talking about people, you know, not being educated to know how to cook, cook the right foods. People can't afford to turn their cookers on at the minute. Mm. That's a bigger problem. There is, there is an illness. If someone can afford two minutes in the microwave more than they can afford half an hour in the cooker. Okay, Claire Baker. Um, if we go back to the first question, it is shocking that in Scotland we are seeing an increase in infant mortality and a decrease in life expectancy. And when I was first elected, it wasn't long after the Campbell Christie report, which put a real emphasis on to preventative health care. And I think the Parliament collectively has failed to do that. Uh, we're still, our NHS is still largely geared towards crisis care and we don't do enough investment into prevention. And I know it's difficult because you're having to shift money from one area to the other. We've just come through a pandemic. But it really is what we need to do. And we need to look at the key factors. Poverty is one of them. But we still have higher smoking rates, drinking rates, all those kind of problematic lifestyle choices that people still make in Scotland. How do we tackle the public health side of it and invest in preventative care? OK, I want to get to one last question. So yeah. quickly, Jim Fairley. The, the the, the young lad up there that talked about education isn't really... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to slightly disagree with you on that one, uh, and I'm going to challenge Ros on this, because some of the stuff that's happening here in Perth and Ros, we've got some fantastic schools in Perth and Ros doing amazing work. Comrie Primary School, mm -hmm. they've got their young kids taught how to make soup, and they wrap up whatever the weather is, and they go out and get their outside class, and they take the soup that they've made with them, and they get an outside education 
well, at least once, possibly twice a week. That kind of stuff's being replicated all across this constituency. So I absolutely, fundamentally believe that our education system is part of the solution so that we make the right choices. The alternative is you ban stuff. If you're going to ban stuff, then that becomes prohibition. So people still have to cho have the choice of the food that they want to eat. They just got to make the right choices for themselves. And we do that in large part through education. OK, your views on that and everything else you hear in the programme, the hashtag is BBCDN on social media. Let's go to our last question of the night, which comes from John Philp. John, evening. Good evening. Would the introduction of a tourist tax uh, be good or bad news for the people of Fife and Perthshire? Thank you, John. Uh, Bill going through Holyrood at the moment to give uh, councils the power to implement a visitor levy. Edinburgh have said they want to be first with this. Other areas looking at it as well. Ros McCall, if you'd been a councillor here, would you vote for one here? I, I wouldn't vote for one here, and I'm <laughs> saying that because I've spoken to a lot of people in the industry and they're telling me locally that that's not something that they would support. Um, I was the councillor for Strathairn. We've got fantastic hotels and B&Bs in the area, um, and we've got some fantastic hotels all across Perthshire, all across Mid-Scotland and Fife. But there's some real hotspots, places like Dunkeld, where tourism really piles up, doesn't it? Yes, and what industry are telling us is that the tax revenue coming in actually wouldn't, it, would, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a benefit over the amount of business coming in and the throughput and the pipeline that these businesses give to the area. Now, I'm listening to business because that's what they're telling me, and I would vote that way accordingly because I, if they, they know their business far better than I do. Alex Sam, is a tourism tax a good idea? Well, it's got good aspects and it's got some dangerous ones as well. I mean, the good aspects are, I mean, Scotland's a country of five and a half million people. Uh, we have 10 million or so tourists come to Scotland, so you broaden the tax base, uh, and that a, a, can be a good way of raising, uh, raising revenue. Now, it's said it's going to be hypothecated, uh, meaning that all the money raised will be invested in facilities, and you can see the benefit of that, you know, here locally and, uh, and elsewhere. The danger, of course, with hypothecation is many taxes start off hypothecated and then change into something else. Uh, the income tax, for example, was hypothecated to pay the debt for the Napoleonic Wars by Pitt the Younger. But after the Napoleonic Wars were over and the debt was paid, they decided to continue with it, as we all know. So I think the danger is it, 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 it translating into something and filling in various black holes in uh, other like, local authority and government expenditure. However, if it could be kept strict to improving facilities, then it could be uh, an idea worth exploring. Jim Fairley, you're a local MSP. Do you need a tourism tax here, do you think? I'd leave that decision up to local authorities who have got a much closer connection with the local <coughs> communities than what MSPs do. The principle around it, I have no objection to. I've got no objection to the, the principle around uh, allowing a local authority to say, yeah, we've got a hotspot over there. I'll give you one example. I, I sit in the Rural Affairs Committee and we're constantly looking at issues around rural depopulation, why young folk can't get a, 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 a house in an area that they want to work. <clears throat> so the tourist tax is one thing. The other thing that the Scottish Government are about to bring in is the ability for local authorities to charge extra money on second homes. Now, there's going to be an outcry about that. I'm quite sure that there is. But it's up to the local authority of that area because they know their area better than anyone. And if they have the powers to make it, one of the things that a lot of the other parties in, in the Parliament have always asked for is well, Edinburgh needs to stay out of our business and let us get on with it. Well, I think that's a good idea that local authorities will make the decision whether or not, whether it's Perth and Cross, whether it's Edinburgh, whether it's Glasgow, it's their decision to decide. Appropriate circumstances. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, lady in the front row. Um, Jim, that, that's all well and good, but there was a housing crisis in Edinburgh that resulted in the thoughts around reducing Airbnb in Edinburgh mm -hmm. so there would be housing. And yet Edinburgh ministers like yourself decided that the rest of Scotland would be suffering for that. So we've now had the short-term let seat scheme pushed upon us and forced, that's more revenue mm. that's going into local councils that we're having to cough up and pass on to our own guests. And now I hear that Edinburgh are complaining about it. Landlords are now putting up a case for it to not come into so Edinburgh. So what do you think about tourism tax? Would you want to see one here locally? No, I wouldn't, because um, the costs for small businesses, like guest houses and small hotels and shops and things like that, are already at a record high because of um, fuel costs and because of energy problems. 
Add on the short-term <coughs> let. Um, a lot of small businesses are fueling their homes and fueling their businesses, so they're already playing a lot already. If you put on a tourism tax at this precise moment in time, then you're just putting more costs upon mm. us. And to be honest, there's only so much you can pass on to your customers. It's just the worst possible time in your view. Claire yeah. Baker. Um, I'm broadly supportive of a tourist tax, but I do hear what the tourism sector say and the way in which the long-term lets system was introduced, I think, it was very problematic. Oh, oh. I think it was a solution that was brought forward for, for Edinburgh. Uh, and, you know, and during the process, the parliamentary process, we tried to tweak it and tried to make it um, more suitable for the whole of Scotland, but I do recognise how difficult the tourism sector has found it. Um, and the pandemic had a huge impact on the tourism sector. I mean, the loss of income during that, uh, you know, was, was really hard uh, and it's been a really tough time for them. But a tourism tax would be the decision of a local authority. Um, it would be the tourists that would pay it. It's a fairly common uh, a policy across Europe. Often if you go to hotels across Europe, you'll be asked to pay a couple of euros you know, it'll be a modest charge. And I am in favour of local authorities having greater control over the taxes they can raise and have more flexibility. Well, it's all kinds of, tour all kinds of tourists. I mean, if, if we went to Edinburgh, we'd yeah, potentially can I, can be doing... a question, Jim? Briefly, yeah, details. very briefly. But look, I was saying today in the Scots Parliament there was a debate about the potential closure of the Dewar Rink here in Perth. Uh, now, you know, the, the world centre of curling with the you know, Olympic champions and, and world champions uh, trained there. Now, the question I want to ask Jim is, would such a visitor charge be able to be invested in a facility like that, which obviously is a major tourist attraction, eh, would that be a way of making sure that that dual rink is not closed? That will be a decision for the local authority. But it's, should it be? It's mm -hmm. up to their... It's up that to their... kind of ring fencing is how the well, money the, should be the, used. The, 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 the local authority get to decide how they're going to spend See, their if, funding. Okay. So if, if they're going the... to raise the funding, they should have the decision. If that was the case, I think a lot more people okay. would support Alex Cole Hamilton. <laughs> I think the beauty of this is that it's the people who are either the elected councillors, the press chair, and of course Fife, uh, who get to make that decision. The Lib Dems are a party of localism. We believe in giving power closer to the people it most serves. And, and this is an example of that. Claire's absolutely right. A tourist tax is a very commonplace thing in you know, capital cities around the world, in uh, places of high tourist interest. You don't think it puts people off? I don't think it puts people off at all. I mean, let's not do our, our beautiful national treasures down. I mean, if I, Royal Perthshire is one of the most beautiful parts of Scotland. But, it's up to the local elected officials to decide, within consultation with the people and, of course, the tourism sector, is it right for them? Now, in Edinburgh, we've agreed it is right for them and, yep. and it is going to see an improvement in things like, you know, tourist-related well, infrastructure. Well, let's see how it works in Edinburgh before in, in anybody else decides on that. We're out of time for this evening. As ever, never enough time on debate. Now, that's it from Perth to our audience in Perth and to you at home uh, watching in Scotland, wherever you are. We'll see you next week from Edinburgh. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well. From all of us in debate night, good night.